Hey everybody, welcome. I'm Michael Bungay Senior. It's often called MBS. Um, you're here for the Success on Your Turn Summit. It is so great that you have shown up, that you signed up. Um, I'm very grateful that you're here. I know Bob and Rich, who we're gonna you're gonna meet in just a minute, are grateful as well. As ever, with the summits that I'm part of and I get to co-create with my friends, it's going to be practical, it's going to be interactive, it's going to be a bit provocative, it's going to be an interesting mix. It's going to be about 75 minutes, and I'm glad you're here. Um, you want to have pen, you want to have paper, you certainly want to have some place you're going to be taking notes because this isn't three people monologuing at you. It's much richer, much more interactive than that. So... I'm going to start off asking a question, and we're going to repeat it a few times, but I'm going to ask you to check in, in in the comments. And the question is this, what's a rose and what's a thorn for you right now? This is one of the great classic check-in questions. And if, you, if you're new to this, um, you know, rose is like what's blossoming, what's rich, what's glorious for you right now. What's thorn is like what's a, what's a point of pain for you right now, what's hard, what's a challenge. Where are you struggling, perhaps? As much as you're willing to share, what's a rose and a thorn for you right now? And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to call up my friend Rich Litvin, and I'm going to introduce him to you if you don't already know him. And I get to ask him the same question. But let, before I ask Rich rose and thorn, let me ask, tell you a little bit about him. I've admired Rich now for, I think, about 15 years since I first knew him. His book and my book show up all the time in the top best-selling books around coaching. My book's called The Coaching Habit. His book is The Prosperous Coach. We've got a bunch of people writing about how do you build a good coaching practice as, as an early questions to us as a panel. And honestly, I'd say start reading Rich's book, The Prosperous Coach, because it is a very powerful way to think about how you flourish financially and otherwise as a coach in the work that you do. Now, Rich coaches ultra successful people. Uh, he has a community which he is called uh, the, the top 4% of performers in sectors. Um, and he really is interested in that conversation about what happens not just to get to success, but what happens after success. So you can see that he was a powerful, wonderful guest to have here. Part of what I loved about Rich is his own work to rework himself and redefine himself. He trained as a teacher. He was on path to become a headmaster. And he came to a point where he went, this is perhaps not my path. How do I rethink about my own success? And so his teaching, his coaching comes not just from theory, but from a lived experience. So Rich Litman, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. That's an introduction. Um, appreciate that. Do I, do, I, do I jump straight into a rose and a thorn? Yeah, I'd love to hear that. What's the rose and a thorn for you now, today? So very real. If you see me looking down, because my son's with me, do you want to come and say hi? Oh, you got nervous. Um, <laughs> so Ellington's here because he's been having a really hard time at school. Mm. And we've been wondering, what do we do and how do we help him? And so, all right, you go off. I'll see you in a minute. He's just leaving right now. But it's very real for me. So this, is, this isn't this is something I could even think of when we talked about doing a rose and a thorn a few days ago. He was refusing to go to school this morning. Mm -hmm. And I talked to one of my mentors, a woman named Sonia Choquette, who helped me relax a little bit around what I need to do. And I took the pressure off, said, no need to go to school today. And he he, he went and dressed in a three-piece suit. And we <laughs> brought him for a wedding. And I wanted to say, you guys to see him on camera because he's really excited to be at home. I've got some things I've planned for him to do the, during the day. And I'm readjusting my mindset to how I can help him. So the rose and the thorn is all mixed up in there with, yeah. with him. Day. It's not clear enough to define two two separate things, but very real and very intense start to my day. I love that, Rich. And in part, what I love about it is not only just speaking from the heart, and we're going to be encouraging everybody to kind of be dropping down into what's real and important and personal for them, but it's also how success is this fluid experience. And I know that the, the part I'm going to be talking about in five minutes' time or so is actually having to think about what are the old stories of success that we might hold and they may have served us really well in the past but maybe they have stopped serving us so well so rich well, welcome was, you're going this morning I'm literally <laughs> feeling oh i'm going to be teaching about success and here it is right in my face like what who cares about how well known you are there's a little kid who's hurting now yeah. i know what counts yeah exactly rich i think you're going to bring on bob i am let me introduce bob to you guys um so 
Uh, hey, Bob, what's really nice is I got an email this morning from Jason Gaynard, who knows both you and Michael. And he said, hey, Rich, I don't know him very well. We've spoken once or twice over the years. And he said, Bob and Michael are really good friends of mine. So seeing that you're doing something with them today, I'm really thrilled about that. And so I, I can speak to your bio. I say a couple of things about who you are in the world. But when great people say things about other people, that has me know, oh, you're somebody special in the world. And I think that's what counts more than what I'm about to say. So look, for you guys who don't know Bob, he's the founder and chairman of Acceleration Partners. It is the premier global partner marketing agency. They've won over 30 awards for world-class company culture. I lead a team, a remote team that I'm proud of, of about seven people. You have a remote team of 270 people, Bob. I think that's incredible. Uh, you, you're a Wall Street, a number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author, uh, Elevate, Friday Forward, How to Thrive in the Virtual Workplace. And the new book that's coming out, Elevate Your Team, is just about this. And this is what I love about you. Here's where I'll end the introduction. That success can be about here's who I am, my success in the world, or it can be about here's what we're about together because no one ever does it alone. And that's what you model for me. I'm glad you're here, man. Thank you, Rich. Sorry, I had to mute on because I had to chase my dog out of the room before. Um, yeah, really excited to to join you both. And and uh, my my rose. Uh, well, maybe start start with the thorn. Uh, my thorn is uh, I've had one of these strings in the last six to nine months of just getting injured, uh, having one ailment, getting over it, having another, like bunch of incongruous, unrelated things, including like I just had this cold last week that just crush me and knock me out. So it's, it's, it's hard. Like, and I think you realize when you don't have your health, like nothing else matters in some of these times, but I, I I've just gone through one of these bad, I just gotta be careful walking down the stairs uh, this week. Now that I'm, I, I'm through, through the cold, it's been a little bit of bad luck. Um, on the flip side, on the rose, uh, I have uh, three teenage children now, uh, one of whom is off at, at college and they increasingly are in, in different places and all over the place and kind of checking in with them. But this was one of those days I woke up and they were all here and in my house. And that's a really uh, nice treat. I love it. Yeah. Kids is what all comes down to. If you have kids, it's those things that m make your heart sing and, and can break your heart all at the same time. Absolutely. All right, so so it's my turn. Um, I'm super excited to be doing this with uh, Michael Bungay Stainer, uh, MBS, uh, as you called. Uh, Michael's works had a huge influence on myself and our company. I, as many of you know and who are on here, he's he's written seven books, including uh, the Coaching Habit, which has sold over a million copies as a self-published book, which is basically the Hall of Fame of books. I, I, Having self-published a book and seeing how hard it is to sell 10,000 copies, like a million copies is just, uh, uh, that means a lot of people value what you do. Um, he's also back to it uh, with his next book arriving in June, uh, How to Work with Almost Everyone, which I really appreciate the the, the preface there since um, most people. But Michael's just in a, uh, he's an incredible thinker. Uh, he's incredibly generous. He's an incredible human being, including helping orchestrate, orchestrate and put this together for other people. So I am super excited to be part of this. And and one of the things I, I, I love that Michael shared is that, look, he's done some incredible stuff. He's also a Rhodes Scholar, but um, success, one of his biggest definitions of success for him is is doing jigsaw puzzles uh, with with his wife. So we'll get a lot into what success looks like in ex extrinsic versus intrinsic, but yeah. I thought I thought that was a, a good definition of success. Thanks, Bob. And what we're doing, if you're just joining us, is we're introducing the three of us, but we're also sharing rose and thorn. You know, what's the moment of pain for us in the moment or a challenge or something we're confronting? What's feeling rich and flourishing and nourishing for us? And there's a bunch of great stuff showing up in the comments, which I'm trying to keep up with. Um, even like Jacqueline, I love my job. I don't love my job. It's, it's a great paradox about life. Um, so thank you for everybody who's sharing that. And I'd encourage you to keep doing that. If I had to name a rose and a thorn for myself, I think the rose would be last night I went out to dinner with um, Shannon, who is the CEO of Boxer Crayons, the company I founded. And what was so nice about that is that by nature of her becoming the CEO and me being the kind of, let's call it a board member for want of a better word, our relationship has become a bit professional because there's all sorts of things that we're trying to support each other to do professionally. But this was a meal with Shannon and me and Mark, Shannon's husband and Marcella, my wife, 
and it was just a conversation about life and not about work and it was just delightful to hang out with somebody who has been a friend is a friend but kind of deepening that friendship i think the thorn i mean i'm, I'm sorry to copy bob here but i <laughs> i played soccer yesterday and today i can hardly walk <laughs> I, I, and that would feel okay if there had been a really successful game of soccer, but it was not a successful game of soccer. I ran around like a headless chicken, making almost no impact whatsoever. So I, maybe like you, Bob, I'm feeling a little bit old right now. So you're going to see more of Bob and more of Rich, because I'm, let me tell you what's get, how we're going to spend the next hour or so together. Um, we've got three main bodies of teaching. I'm going to start us off. I'm going to do the first piece of teaching, and it's called... I'm just making, reading my notes here, release the brake before you hit the accelerator. When we were designing this, we wanted to come up with three paradoxes of success because so often in the self-help world and so on, success is treated like this obvious big thing that you should, you know, 10x everything and crush everybody to get there. I'm like, success is slippery and paradoxical and elusive and rich. And we wanted to capture some of that. So I'm going to be doing a bit of teaching around that. It's going to be a classic teaching moment. Rich is and I are going to work together on that. Then Bob is going to be talking about how success is more about others' success than perhaps your own. It's a really strong connection to his new book, Elevating Others, and through teamwork. Um, That's going to be more of an interview style process. And then Rich is going to be talking about uh how less success is more and it's actually going to be doing some live coaching and rich is a gorgeously good coach and so that's just going to be an extremely rich experience and if you're a coach and i know a number of you are you're going to be in for a treat just watching a master coach um be present ask great questions hold space and do that wonderful work so that's what's ahead of us Thank you for sharing your, your rose and thorn in the comments. I'm going to kick us off right now, which is, um, oh, here's the one other thing I wanted to add that I'd for, almost forgotten. Um, midway, we're going to just take a small break and we're all three of us are going to share just a little bit about the books that we've got coming out in the next little while. It's going to take no more than like three or four minutes in total, but we really want you to hear about the stuff we've been working on because actually tied up for us in success is us pouring heart and soul and mind and brain into these new books. And we want to tell you about those because you're going to get access to the first chapters of those um, through the follow-up that we, we send you. So you know what's coming. And after we've given you a little interstitial about the books, we'll move on to Rich's wonderful coaching. So you're going to look forward to that. Um, that is what I needed to tell you to start us off. So I'm going to do a little bit of teaching. So here we go. This was called releasing the brake before you press the accelerator. And it comes from um, an insight around um, uh, psychology and economics, um, really about how do you make change? And we are wired as human beings to assume that the solution to everything is adding on. <laughs> you know, you're like, you've got to go, right, what's the next thing to take on? One of the most powerful things to understand is that you need to understand what to let go of, to release, to sort of say farewell to before you can step in to what's next. In other words, and those of you who know me and have heard me teach before know this question well, you've got to figure out what to say no to before you can say yes. And if part of what this is about is understanding success on your terms, you need to figure out what old stories of success that you, meet, you need to say no to so that you can start saying yes to the next versions of success, the, the versions of success that might be most true and most powerful and most useful for you right now. So when we did a, a dress rehearsal for this, um, and I talked Rich and Bob through what I wanted to teach. Rich and Bob both went, this is good, Michael, but this is about a two-hour training session you've got. And I'm like, I know, this is new thinking, and I've only just come up with it. So I went away, and I tried to reduce it, and I, I didn't do a terribly good job. So this might be a, a feel a little rushed, and my apologies. So consider this me planting seeds with you, perhaps, rather than getting to a, a harvest. But I want to plant these seeds with you. Um, 
And I think this is helpful. So I'm going to ask you to think about your definition of success for you right now. And I know that's so broad as to be almost impossible to take on. So I'm going to give you five specific areas that fall within your life that you might choose to think about success. And here they are. Where you find delight, how you spend time, who your people are, what your stuff is, and what your reputation is. And here's my request for you now. I want you to pick one of these, the one that feels like it's got the most heat for you, the most kind of resonance, the most kind of, oh, this has got some sort of thing that's calling me. Delight, time, people, stuff, and repute. And I'm going to go a little deeper in this. I'm going to give you the questions that I think are behind that. And this is going to help you make the choice about what make me most powerful for you. So when you think about delight, I'm thinking, what's your definition for where you find deep contentment? For time, I think the question might be, what's the highest use of your hours? For people, I think the question is, who's around you? For stuff, I think the question might be, what are you accumulating or what's been accumulated? And for reputation, for repute, it's how are you known? And you can see that there's that each one of these is an existential question. <laughs> There's not a single thing here that is trivial. It's all big and they're all kind of tied together and connected for sure. But for now, pick one. Pick one that is powerful for you. And I can see people sharing that in the in the chat. Nicole is coming in with people. Katie is six uh, stuff. Uh, Steve is stuff as well. So even as you choose between these, you're getting an insight as to what how you've been thinking about success and what does success mean to you because you could choose to emphasize any one of these as kind of the, the primary definition of success. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take your best guess at what's success for you now in one of those five areas. What's success for you now? Take your best guess. I'm saying best guess because this is a hard thing to wrestle with. But I'm going to ask you to try write it down or type it into the chat because writing it down makes it real. And even if it's a bit incoherent and a bit vague and a bit too high level, a bit too low level, doesn't matter. Making your best guess about something is extremely powerful. So while you're doing this and while you're thinking about this, and you can see Justin, our producer, has put that prompt up in the screen there. What's your best guess for success? Write it in the comments. Um, I'm going to call my friend Rich because I'm really curious to know what's resonated with him and all of that. So, Rich, to start off with, I mean, any reflections on those five ca uh, categories there? Yeah, I mean, what's real for me is what I shared with you earlier. Um, I can show you now. My son is here with me. Oops, where's the angle? There he is. Uh, if you make it a bit wider, Justin, in my shot, you'll see Ellington down there playing with Lego. Um, and that's – there he is in his suit. Nice and suit. That's, that resonates right now. It, it's it's the people side of things. It, yeah. It's and, and what what's really important because success. You know, I've got a new book like coming out like you guys have, and all my attention is like, how do we do the marketing for that? What do we do? How do I get more well known? Build my reputation, and then there's what really counts. Yeah. And so that really struck me as you said those five things. So, as you think about kind of naming people as of those five areas, this is the thing that feels most resonant for you as a kind of a facet of success that you want to look at. What would you say has been a, a past or a kind of recent definition of success for you? Or do you have a one that feels kind of real for you right now? Well, I'm going to dive into this a little bit later when I go on to do my, my section. Um, I have a, a, a list that I call I'm successful when. Mm. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about this over the years because in the past I was driven by a need to prove myself. It was actually usually to my father. And it led to lots of success and lots of accomplishments, but they always felt empty. And so one of the things I found coaching very successful people is you hear this phrase a lot. Um, I, I've, I've everything, I have everything I ever needed, and I still feel empty on the inside. And so that fascinates me about success, Michael. And yeah. where, where am I missing on that one still? 
Yeah. And so when you think about people, what's your definition of success for you now around who's around you? Well, I'm not, the, the answer that came to me initially was my definition of success around people is elevating them, really having them thrive. Mm. Uh, that, that's what Bob does, you know, that, that whole elevate idea. Wow. Um, who's around me is a, a slightly different version of that. And, and I'm looking at that constantly. Who is in my life? who helps me to thrive and where is life not long enough that I can spend time with everybody. I could, and maybe should, but I haven't got the time or energy any longer. And yeah. I actively look at who can I have in my life? Who do I want to have in my life? Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, for me, I think people is probably the one I would have picked as well. Mm. And I am um, noticing the shift and success for me because uh, you know, in, in some ways I'm driven by kind of, can I hang out with people with high status? You know, so like at the moment I'm like trying to negotiate with Brene Brown to blurb my book and I'm like, that feels something. Yeah. But, but the truth is when I think about the people I'm looking for, I'm looking for people who make me laugh and who make me think. And I'm like, how do I spend time with those people? And so I'm really noticing how old versions of success, which is around associating with people with high status, mm -hmm less important to me right now. But here's a teaching I want to do with everybody listening in at the moment, which is like you've taken your best guess of success for you. You've picked one of the five facets and then you've written down something or you've articulated as best you can what that definition of success is. Here's, here's where you get into the, 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 the real meat of the work for you. And again, I'm, I'm planting seeds here. Every choice you make, and you're making a choice with what you're naming as success for you has prizes and punishments, prizes and punishments. And there's um, a consequence to every choice you make. And what I'm hoping you're seeing here are, are two things. One is there's a, a recent or a past definition of how you've held success for one of those things. And you may be able to look at that and go, I can start seeing the prizes and the punishments for doing that. When I think of my past definition of success for the people around me, you know, the, the prizes are I get to have the aura effect. I get to have their success rub off on me. I get to be, you know, go to nice places to eat meals because I'm hanging out with people who are financially successful in some way. So there's some benefit to that. Um, but there's a prize in that I'm, uh, I'm actually wearing a bit of a mask when I'm doing some of that. Now, when I, when I think of my current definition of success, and this is what I want you to do as well to the folks listening in, which is like, as you're defining success for you now, know that there are prizes and punishments in that definition as well. So the prize is that I get to laugh. And laughter is such an important part of, I know it's a manifestation of happiness, but it, it's also a generator of happiness for me, which is like, if I'm with people who make me laugh, they have the same sense of humor as I do, so they see the world that I do. So they tease me like I tease them. It is a place of being loved if I'm with people who I, I love. But it's also a place of anonymity. I'm less well known if I'm hanging out with people who are just making me laugh and making me think because they're not the, they don't have the big titles and they're not fancy people for the most part. So I'm seeing that. Now, how about for you, Rich? As you weigh up prizes and punishment, does anything land for you there? Okay, let me unmute. Um, yeah, I definitely see the cost. Uh, you know, what what got me here won't get me there. And some of the things I needed to have in my life to get where I am today, uh, there's now a cost to having those things in my life. Uh, I loved your definition of friendship being around people who make me think and make me laugh. And you put making me laugh first, which I think is beautiful. Because um, I, I have on my, you know, uh, what, what I'm successful when list, I spend great time with friends. Mm. But I didn't add in actually how am i defining who my friends are and i think that you just give me some seeds to elevate what's coming next around friendship for me yeah fantastic you know there's um for people who want to go further on this around friendship in particular there's a british academic called dunbar d-u-n-b-a-r um famous for dunbar's number um mm. uh which is like the most names we can remember is about 150 people but actually, he's got numbers. He's got a, a range of different numbers and talks about the different numbers of kind of different levels of intimacy and vulnerability that we can we can hold. I think his book is called Friends, and it is a great 
understanding of the structure of friendship. So people who want to go deeper in that, you might choose to, to dig into Mr. Dunbar's work or probably Professor Dunbar's work. Rich, brilliant. Thank you for working with me on this. In the chat, if you wouldn't mind, for the folks that have gone through this first piece of teaching, we're already done the first piece of teaching. Time flies when you're having fun. What was most useful or most valuable for you? What's really landed for you so far? You know, is it Rich sharing some of his thoughts? Is it seeing Rich's son in his awesome three uh, suit? Because that's basically been the cool point, point for me. Is it those five different parts of success? Is it understanding that we have old stories of success and we need to say no to some of those to allow new stories to come in? Is it about understanding that every choice you make is prizes and punishments? And you need to be able to understand the prizes and punishments before you fully commit to the choice. Playing perfect, that success is perfect. Uh, Chaz, um, a number of people, Patrick and Daniel, the five parts of success. Simplifying the definition of success. You know, I, I'm not sure I simplified the definition of success. I may have complicated it. <laughs> but I think that's true, which is like I think uh, – uh, a definition of success is overly simple might be you might be suspicious of it because you have different areas different parts of your life and you may want to choose different articulations of success for those five different areas for the second piece of teaching um i'm going to work with my friend bob bob glazier because he's got a, a brand new book uh it builds on one of his earlier books called elevate and this is about elevating others the power of actually bringing others uh, to life, elevate your team. Brilliant. And Bob, that comes out. It's like days away, right? When does it, so, when does it actually? Uh, uh, hours. So mid, hours. midnight, midnight tonight, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see how lucky we it's are. Blinking. It's yeah. Yeah, because <sighs> I can tell you that the day before your book launches. Uh, I can't speak for Bob, but I'm basically in a fetal position on the floor. Kind of. This is distracting me. It's good. It's good. It's therapy. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, Hey, Bob, before we get into this conversation, I'm going to ask you some questions about how do you elevate others if you're trying to also elevate your success? But I'm curious to know for you, what landed from that conversation between me and Rich? Uh, there are a bunch of different things. I, you know, as Rich, I think it comes down to people sometimes and, and, and it aligns to what I talk about in my book around sort of spiritual, intellectual, physical, and emotional capacity, which is once you understand kind of what you want and what you want to do, then the people you choose to spend time with and associate with and the ones equally that you choose to move away from, because I don't think to me, things are a swap. They're not just an ad. We can't just keep adding. So I think sometimes the look, there's a, someone like you, or I have people in my life where I might only spend two hours a year with them, but they're awesome hours. So I'm like, how yeah. do I do more of that and less of some of the, the other folks? Yeah. Where, where, where was the seed of success planted for you? Where does your definition of success come from? Yeah, so this has evolved, and I think about myself, and I look at other people, and I, what I've kind of studied, and and I think there's a difference between success and achievement, and I, I tend to find that success is this internal definition that mm. a lot of people comes from uh, parents, friends, teachers. I was actually going to say this, and Rich said it, but but people you wanted to prove wrong that becomes <laughs> like you know something that you hold on to. Um, but when you hear people talk about something they did, they never talk about their success. They talk about their achievement or something they wanted and then they got there. So I, I think I've had combinations of, of all those things. But, but yeah. as I've sort of aged and trying to become more evolved, I, I think my definition is like, what makes me happy? What makes me engaged? And, and where am I using my highest or unique ability? Right. That, that, that becomes more around success that is, that is to me. I see a lot of people who are chasing this definition of success that was extrinsic and put upon them. And I think they're going to get to the top of a mountain and look down and be like, I climbed the wrong mountain. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a, um, a useful and, and well-known metaphor, which is like you climb your first mountain and then you go, have I climbed the wrong mountain? Right. And then you're like, what's the And, and where you bullied up that mountain, right? Yeah. Or, or I said, there are a lot of people who might be a world-class surgeon and they just wanted to be in a cabin writing in Montana, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really what they wanted. You're bringing up the, my teacher interview, parent-teacher interview, and my, teach, my parents came back going, your Latin teacher, Mrs. Primrose, I still remember her name, <laughs> said to them, Michael will never be really good at anything. He'll probably be a good number two the rest of his life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Mom and Dad, first of all, why are you telling me that? And secondly, right. well, I'm a horrible thing for a teacher to say. So, yeah. Um, 
So part of what your new book is about, Bob, is about how do you elevate others? Um, why do you, why should you be spending time focused on others' success? I, you know, I always loved growth organizations and I wanted to build one, but what I saw a lot of them is the company grew and it broke all the people and everything as they went along the way. And then they brought in new people. And I was like, well, that doesn't look like fun. Like, how do we go on, on this journey together? And we started to think about how do we build an organization? How do we do things that builds people? And we grow the organization by growing people. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and and so I think that was the business side. There's also this concept of, of uh, hedonic uh, adaptation or the hedonic treadmill, which some of us know, which is when you get anything, you'll get used to it and it won't provide you enjoyment anymore. And so, again, a lot of success, I think, is is lonely. So if you try to do something that's just about you and you get it. Ryan Holiday is a great story about finally making the New York Times bestselling list, like all he wanted. And he was mowing his lawn and he, they called him and he's like, all right, what's the next goal? Right. It just. <laughs> No matter how much we think we're going to avoid that, it just, you know, we want the BMW, we want it, we get it, and 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 the new car smell goes away. So I think what's been proven pretty statistically in the last is if you do it with other people or bring people along with you or bring them on the journey and make it just a little bit less about yourself. I get that in, in theory. Um, there is something magical about watching others flourish and succeed. The, the thing that I find hardest to navigate is how do you not sacrifice your own success, life, yeah. happiness to enable other people? I mean, is that famous Adam Grant book, Give and Take, where he's like, you know what? The people, uh, the people who give often there's that one form of giving, which is that has you crushed and depleted and yeah. exhausted and at the bottom of, of the ladder. How do you manage your own success and that tension between I want to be, I want to succeed, but I also want other people to succeed? Well, every time we get on an airplane, we rarely listen to the announcement they make. But, you know, there's this thing that they say when the oxygen masks are going to come down. And then if you're a parent, you probably gasped at some point when they say, look, take care of yourself before you put on your children's or, or, or your parents, because you know, you're, you're, you're useless to other people in that case, if you're, if, if you're out cold, but I, I think it's an important metaphor. And look, you had this version of giving where you're just kind of throwing yourself out there and, and, and you know, giving more than you have. I, I see it more as how do you pull people along with you? How do you sort of elevate them, lift them up, pull them along, which shouldn't be a drag. You're kind of helping to build the scaffolding, for other people as you go along. And I think that's a, that's a very different um, version of, of, of thinking about it. And I don't, I don't think that's an intensive and a lot of time and sort of the bridge between the step, what I talked in elevate and elevate your team is when you just model some of these improvements or the things that you're doing or otherwise people come along with you. Yeah. I agree with that. What have you had to unlearn as your quest for success has shifted from just you writing books that have succeeded, growing organizations that have become big and successful and influential. What, if anything, has shifted in terms of what you had to unlearn in terms of how you've held success? Yeah, I, I, it's kind of what I was saying before with the hedonic. I had to unlearn that that I would really get very little enjoyment of hitting a milestone and and realizing that. You ha I had to make success about about the journey and not the goal, right? I think I always think about an Olympic athlete. They spend their whole life and then they win the medal or don't win the medal, and then and then it's like off the side of a cliff, like and it's over either way. So there's something like the amazing athletes love practice, right? Yeah. The amazing you know writers love the writing process. So I, I I think I had to think about things that were more enduring or they were about the journey versus the destination yeah. because show me any high achieving person who has a thing and I, they, they get to that destination and it's not four minutes before they move the goalpost. Oh, uh, you know, I, I get asked a lot by people around book marketing and yeah. honestly, because I've had that one success of the book and I honestly don't feel I know that much about book marketing because I got, I got, you know, I worked hard, but I got some sort of magic fairy dust sprinkled on the coaching habit to help it succeed. But, but, but I've got two things that I say to them, which is like, first of all, decide how long a game you want to play. 
Yeah. Because you could, you could choose to not launch a book or not really try and market it very much, you know, just celebrate the, the fact that the book's there. So decide how long a game you want to play. Secondly, on the day your book comes out, celebrate. <laughs> Have a party. Yeah. Because actually, for most authors, the day they're so booked, exhausting. Yeah. A moment of, of celebration. <laughs> it's a moment of exhaustion and sadness because you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. Oh, the book hasn't become number one in anything. Oh, what's the point? And I'm like, you got to have a party. Are you having a party tomorrow? Uh, not tomorrow, but I'm, I'm, I actually scheduled this time where the book launches and then I go right on uh, vacation with a bunch of uh, friends and stuff, oh. family. So that, yeah. that, that, that will be the celebration. But just one of those classic asking for friends because this is the challenge yeah. I often have. Um, when I'm trying to bring out the success of others, when I'm trying to be in service to others, I often have a dose of niceness get in the way of that. And so I've held for myself a, a way of uh, a, a saying, fierce love is what yeah. I try to bring to how I support or manage or lead or whatever the people that are in my life. Love meaning I'm fully committed to their greatness and unlocking their own greatness and their own potential and being the best versions of themselves. Fierceness in that I'm going to hold their feet to the fire where necessary. I'm going to push them yeah. when required. How do you find that? Where do you find that balance between I want your success? That means I'm going to challenge you and provoke you and push you at times as well as encourage you and support you. Uh, I always said, and I said in one of my books, I'm not the person that you call for me to tell you the thing that you want to hear. That's never been my thing. I, I love Kim Scott's radical framework around, mm -hmm. candor I, framework I, around this. And it, I think it's very similar to fierce love. I think radical candor. And what Kim talks about it, right? Get, you, you challenge directly and care personally, and that's radical candor. Obnoxious aggression is her quadrant, you know, where you don't care personally, but you challenge directly. But I told her she should write, my last time I interviewed her, the book that she should write is, my favorite one is ruinous empathy. And I think that's the default for a lot of us, which is, we, <laughs> that's your default where you, and look, this is more important for coach that, that it, ruinous empathy is where you care personally, but you don't challenge directly. And think about award-winning actors, you know, athletes or otherwise, like, like they had a coach that pushed them and that was tough. And they, I, I, a lot of people, and I hear them call the person to tell them exactly what they want to hear. And look, there's a time when you just want people to listen and you want empathy. But if you want to get better, you need the people in your circle who will call the baby ugly and yeah. and um, a challenge. You know, Tim Ferriss and 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 talked about this with Adam Grant. And they talked about a challenge network, and and they have people particularly in their lives that will call the baby ugly and help them. Or they will say, Adam will say, Tim will, I think it was Tim said, tell me 10% of the book. You read the book. I know you said you liked it. What 10% would you cut and what 10% would you keep? So I, nice. I, I, look, a coach, anyone in our life, like you, we need to push people and care at the same time. And I think it, it's proven that that formula works well. You, you talked about the four quadrants that you share in the new book. Um, and I know when we've talked beforehand, you're often saying that the spirituality quadrant is the one that is often most out of alignment. What is that quadrant about? And what does it mean to be in alignment with that? Yeah, so for me, spiritual capacity is understanding kind of first and, first and foremost, your core values. Like, what are your values? What do you stand for? To me, values are the ultimate decision-making rubric in your life, whether it's around, particularly around the big three, your vocation or company you want to be in, the community you want to be in, or who you choose as your partner. I think a lot of people have a gut feel around values. I think that you know when you're talking to someone who's violating your values or something happens outside of it, but they, they can't articulate them. They can't say them enough which I, I got the analogy of like you're driving through the tunnel and I see the wall and I see the lines rather than hitting the wall and knowing yeah. to pull the car off. So I, I, I think that people I know who are, can articulate their core values uh, tend to be operating at a, at a different level. And then that leads to the other things of, okay, I know what I value. What do I want to learn? What do I want to work towards? You know, my physical discipline becomes really important. And then who are the people I want to be around to what you said before? Like if I know what I want, and I know what my values are. That's a huge driver for who I need to spend more time with and less time with. Yeah. Bob, our work is almost done here. What needs to be said that hasn't yet been said about what does it take to elevate others, to allow others' success to flourish at in a way that doesn't compromise your own? 
Yeah, I think I think to summarize, I, I don't think it's about one or the other. Like I said, I think it's about build the ladder, lift as you rise, pull pull people with you. But to do that, you need to be really true about yourself. You need to take care of yourself to physical capacity. You know, if you don't have any energy for yourself, you're not going to have any or otherwise. So I would say focus on yourself, figure out the thing you're great at, the thing you really want otherwise, and then you will naturally be excited to to pull people up and along with you on that. I love that. And I'm going to just add to that, if I might, by saying it's taken me a long time to learn what I am good at and not good at in terms of managing other people. And there's there's some forms of management that I'm outstanding at. I have very high trust. I give people a lot of responsibility. I'm relentlessly encouraging for people. I really get kind of too stressed out about things. But if you need somebody who is a micromanager, and I'm a, I'm a pretty terrible manager yeah. at that, that level. So part of it is around, and this is connecting to you, it's like if you understand your values and your strengths and how you play best, you can then negotiate a relationship with the people you're working to say, here's how I can best elevate you. Here's how I'm not going to be able to elevate you. So you're going to need to find other ways of finding that support. Yeah. And if you're if you're a leader or you're a coaching leader, I think the best thing a leader can do is say, and I've done this, here's why you would love working for me. And here's why you would hate working for me. And they're probably one in the same, but that that's an authentic place of, of leadership. Brilliant. Rich, thank you. And congratulations on the new book and best of luck with the book launch tomorrow. I mean, I know you've there's a thousand things you've been doing behind the scenes to get ready for this. Thanks for being with us today as well. Thanks. Th thanks for having me here to distract me from uh, <laughs> from the inevitable. So so speaking of books, uh, as, as Michael mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, we are all in the segment of having some books come out. We just talked about mine, but but Rich and Michael both have uh, new books coming out and they're going to spend a minute each and tell you about them. So um, I think, uh, Michael, you're going to kick us off. Oh, sorry, Rich, you're going to kick us off. Oh, yeah, Rich. Yeah. Rich. Rich, I think I'm you're on mute. mute. That's actually Rich's book is on lip reading <laughs> and, the, and the skills of lip reading. So that's the that was the first, <laughs> that's all the first chapter of Rich's book on lip reading. You know what? Silence is the most important skill in coaching. And I was modeling it for you guys. Well done, sir. Uh, Bob, thank you. You know what? A few years ago, I would have felt a bit embarrassed if you said this, like promoting a book. You're not supposed to do that. I'm about service and taking care of others. But when I think of you two, your books are so important that I want to hear about them. And so I have to own that for myself. I've spent 10 years writing my second book. Uh, the first book is called The Prosperous Coach. Prosperous Coach is about how to build a word of mouth business, one conversation at a time in a world where we th think we have to be online, doing all the internet marketing, SEO, Google AdWords, you name it. Mm. Most coaches are people people. And when you're a people person, most of the time that stuff overwhelms you and you don't have to do it. And The Prosperous Coach, uh, uh, has, still sells 2,000 copies uh, a month, 10 years after it was published. Amazing. But I knew it was time to, to write something else. And this book, The Powerful Coach, is coming out uh, Q3 or Q4 later on in this year. And, and this book is about how to create IP, how to create tools and distinctions, and how to be known in the world of coaching so people knock on your door. It's how to widen your impact. The first book is about how to deepen your impact. This is about how to widen your impact. And there's a section in there that I love called How to Coach a Superhero. Because for me, we can get overwhelmed when we meet someone who's got the outside trappings of success. They've got more money than me. They're more intelligent than me. They're more renowned than I am. And actually, those people need your support more than you think and more than they know. Right. And that's the purpose of this book. And I'm excited for it to come out. I'm too, Rich. You know, I, I was just writing a, preview, a prologue for a, a podcast that I'm about to release. And it, the, the interview is with a TED fellow. So one of the people that the TED organization said, you're an amazing person. And I work with TED fellows in a kind of coaching facilitator role. They were super successful. They cracked some big problem and they were all struggling so much. <laughs> and it was a real lesson to me around how just because you've had success in one arena doesn't mean you're not desperate for support and encouragement and foundations and other arenas. So I think you're speaking to that really powerfully. Nice. Thank you. Let me boast about my book for a moment. So I've got a new book coming out June 27th. It's called How to Work with Almost Anyone. And it really builds on 20 years of experience of me trying to figure out how to work with people. And um, at the heart of it is something called the Keystone Conversation, 
which is when you talk about how will we work together rather than what will we work on? Because most of the time, as soon as you start a working relationship or even the ones you have at the moment, you're like, let's get on with it. Let's get the stuff done. And actually, if you can pull back and say, how will we work best together? What would like a really great working relationship between you and me look like? And what should we not do so we don't sabotage our own relationship? You create a relationship that is safe, that is vital, meaningful of life, and that is repairable. Because every relationship gets dinged and cracked and bent a little bit. If you're able to collectively repair that, your relationship is going to last longer and have more impact. So the Keystone Conversation is the heart of it. Five good questions that structure a Keystone Conversation. I was... I really wanted to get to to share the first chapter with you as as part of the giveaway. It's still being baked. We're we're really close. We and it was so close. In fact, I am literally recording the audio book for this uh, tomorrow, uh, but I don't quite have it in a in a thing to share with you. But it is coming out June twenty seventh. So you're going to hear increasing amounts about that from me coming up. And Michael, Bob, you know they say that the last ten percent of any book takes ninety percent of your time. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm that was not, years for you, Rich. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> What's that saying? Is um, I'm ninety percent done, so I'm halfway there. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Bob, do you want to say anything else about your book? Yeah, just quickly. Um, really excited. My new book, Elevate Your Team. It's coming out tomorrow, so it's it's living with me all day, although, although it's ghosted there. Um, and and in this book, I take the same capacity building framework that I used in my book, Elevate, which was really more about a personal development tool for both leaders and their teams and, and, and shifted that to what does that same framework look like in an organizational capacity to show how you create a culture that grows because the people are growing. Um, and, and I just think that like, sometimes it's better to be uh, lucky than good. And, and we're hitting a point in the market right now where things are really changing, right? I, I think the the playbook of the past decade, the grow the organization as fast as you can, uh, even if it breaks your people, is is not going to work for the next decade. The the era of cheap money is coming to an end. We have three years of a pandemic and burnout now. And I know people want to get back to growth, but growth has almost become kind of a, a, a bad word now. And I think that's because of, of how we've grown. So this, is, this book's really about how do you build an organization that grows because its people are growing and getting better and, and advancing. They're, they're, they're riding on the growth wave. They're not, not being crushed by it. Uh, and I think it'll be a great framework for the next generation of leaders. All right. So we're back back to the programming. Uh, and, and each one of these sessions is, is a little bit different. So we had a presentation. We had sort of an interview. Uh, and, and, you know, they say sh showing is better than doing. So I'm excited to work with Rich here as he is going to, uh, put on his, his coaching hat and, and demonstrate, uh, to us, uh, what he wants to talk about and helping people, um, figure out, uh, success and the distinctions between success. So Rich, let me turn it over to you. And I think you're, you're, you're bringing on a, a special guest. Is that correct? I am. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. Let's bring on Lavina, and I'm going to give a bit of context to where we're going today. So my invitation for everyone who's here, hi, Lavina. My invitation for everyone who's here is as you watch and listen, you can put on your coaching hat. You can watch what I'm doing, see what you like, see what you don't like, ask yourself, what would you do differently? Why was I doing it that way? And you can also put on your client hat. And sometimes that's the most powerful hat for us to wear as coaches and leaders out in the world. We're too often in a position of, I know what's happening. I know where we need to go. When you put your client hat on, just trust as I'm coaching Lavina, you're being coached too. And that's my invitation for you. Hi, Lavina. Hey, Rich. Hey. So as I'm listening to this talk on success, I want to bring in a couple of distinctions for you and then see where we go. We deliberately didn't plan this. We have nothing in mind for where we're going to go. And I have about 15 minutes. So I want to take off all the pressure. Uh, otherwise, I'm under pr pressure to perform, to try and get it right, to look good, which is not a powerful place to come from as a coach. And, and take off the pressure for yourself too. I, I love being on Zoom where we can see all the audience, but I like the fact that we can't see an audience right now. It's literally just you and me and maybe my son. But it's just the two of us. And so we can have a conversation. And, and so the distinction I want to bring in, there's a couple. The University of Santa Monica uh, teaches a master's degree in spiritual psychology. And they draw a distinction between the goal line 
and the soul line. And the goal line goes from left to right, and it goes off in that right-headed direction, and it's all about more and more success in external qualities. And it's the soul line, which really goes down and inwards. It's about depth. Another version of that distinction is from a book called The Road to Character by David Brooks. And he draws a distinction between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues and eulogy virtues. And you kind of get it immediately. Resume virtues are things like income, job title, and the size of your house. Eulogy virtues are things like being helpful, being loved, being brave, being honest, being capable of deep love, and being remembered. And an irony is that many people aspire for the latter, but put all their effort into the former. Now, you've been super successful in all sorts of ways, right from your 20s early on, building multi-million dollar companies and being part of teams that are making a big difference in the world. And here we are having a conversation. So where are you? How can I support you? What's going on? Um, I'm really noticing one thing that I'm connecting to deeply in this conversation as I'm listening to everyone is this distinction that you often speak about, slowing down mm. to speed up. And I think... Yeah. One of my greatest strengths is I move incredibly, incredibly quickly in my brain and the way that I take action in the way that I create in the world. And I'm in this place that you highlighted where I look into my life and I say, I can honestly say I've got it all. I'm thrilled. And so much more impact that I want to make. And I'm experiencing some tension right now in my life between being where I am and really appreciating everything that I've created, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my husband, my practice, my community, my um, expression of self, like really, really being present with that yeah. is hard for me because my mind is always thinking about what comes next. Hmm. Now that you said that out loud, what thought arises next? What comes up? Slow down. Hmm. I think those of us who operate fast think fast, move fast, it's often a key to success, that we're terrified that slowing down is the complete opposite of that. And it's why I teach this distinction of slow down to speed up. I'm not saying slow down to lie on your couch watching Netflix with a giant bowl of Cheetos on your tummy. I'm saying slow, which is, that's what it feels like though, that's what we imagine. So I've driven a very fast racing car a number of times in my life on a track. And what racing car drivers are taught is slow down to go smooth, go smooth to go fast. Literally, the slower you are on some of the fastest cars on the planet, the faster you will drive. It resonates. Yeah. It really resonates. And I'm, I'm exaggerating my pauses a little bit and holding the silence a little bit longer just to model this for you, even here in this moment. Now, you said something that landed for me. You said, I want to have so much more impact. Tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me about the impact you'd love to have in the future. Um, well, you and I talked about this when we met in Curacao um, about a month ago. I'm really thrilled over the last few years, I really focused on building my coaching practice and um, doing so through using the prosperous coach approach, having one powerful conversation at a time. And while there's so much more, I'm really excited to create there. Um, I really have trust in the, the process and the, the space of unknown that I'll explore there. So that 
is not really where I'm looking as I think about what's next. Um, where I'm really looking is at education in the United States, because I shared with you, um, part of what's really made me who I am today is a really unique and special educational environment that I got to be a part of as a kid. And I don't think that is really commonly accessible for most people in the United States. And I can feel the, um, I can feel a lot of energy arising as I share that with you because it's a bigger game than I've ever looked to really transforming the future of education. So now we're talking, this, this always gets me excited when people have what I call an impossible goal. A goal looks, if you can accomplish it on your own, you're not playing big enough. This is the kind of thing, if you're gonna have an impact on the education system, there's not one, one thing that one person can do, except they connect with others. They make something, have a goal bigger than themselves. I feel that inside of you, the energy being to build on that. So here's a distinction I have, that space is where miracles occur. What's the smile that comes up when I bring that in? <laughs> well, that was so much of what you shared in Curacao. Um, and I'm so aware of that. And yet the instinct to do something, to move, to create, to take action kicks in so quick. And there's when I slow down, there's not really tension. And I'm just aware of how well developed that muscle is. So let me offer you a question one of the most powerful coaching tools I believe that we have is the power of gentle reflection. So my invitation is for you for the next 30 days before you go to bed, think about this question. We'll refine the question in a second, but what comes to me is you know how to create. You create fast, you create furious, and magic happens as a result. And you could spend your whole life doing that and accomplish more than most people. You already have in some ways, but this is the difference in resume goals and eulogy goals. Would you feel fed at the end of that? So the question I have for you is, if every day for the next 30 days before bed, you ask yourself this question, where did I spend time creating fast? And where did I spend time slowing down to allow the miracles occur to occur? And if you ask yourself that once a day, simply some reflection at the beginning, you just be noticing. It might be uncomfortable, it might be painful, but things begin to shift when we put our attention on them. And so if you put your attention on that, that distinction, between creating fast and the space for miracles, I'd be really curious what might happen. I'm curious too. I can feel the settling in my body. Yeah. As I, as I really, um, absorb them practice. Yeah. So I, I coach around insight. And, and for me, with an insight moment, often someone goes very still, they get very quiet because they're beginning to reflect on what might happen if they played out a new idea or a distinction into their future. And, it, and when I'm there, I'm there. I don't need to go any deeper, turn this into a seven step plan. And it feels like we're there. That's what you needed in this moment. So I'm going to take you off the hot seat. Thanks for playing. And, and as Lavina goes off the hot seat, thank you, Lavina. As Lavina goes off the hot seat, I'll bring you back in, Bob. Hey, man. Yeah. Um, let, let's yeah. give Lavina some some appreciation and love for 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 what looked like a very intimate conversation <laughs> amongst a a large group of people. So so uh, you let her know in the chat. And I'm curious thank too you. for the people listening, Rich. I'll give it back to you. What what. What, what from that conversation, what wisdom can you take for yourself or, or your coaching practice? What did you, what did you notice about, about the tactics Rich were using or, or the responses again for, for you or for those of you who coach in your, in your practice? So Rich, back to you. 
Well, that's what I was going to ask, actually. That's what I wanted to know from people. What did you get from that? What, what did you see from either side, being a client or being a coach? We can take Lavina off camera now. Let's give her some space. <laughs> Literally give her some space. It can begin now. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to see what comes up for other people. Uh, what about for you, Bob? Where does that land for you uh, in this? Because we know, look, we teach what we most need to learn. So I know this one very well. I, I think fast. I'm driven. I'm ambitious. I want to make things happen really fast. And practicing creating this space for miracles can be really difficult at times. Yeah, I mean, you? Rich, I, I, just watching you, and, and I've seen this in interviewing or otherwise, but again, the awkward silence, leaving the space, that is where some of the stuff, the best stuff comes out of. That That's what I took tactically. The other thing, interesting, the imagery that came to me that combined a couple of things I've heard is I, I have struggled with the space thing too. I, I think if it's a race, right, sometimes when we get to one lap, and we get through the first finish line, um, and we're already tired. That 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 is the point where we actually need to slow down the most. I actually found myself accelerating <laughs> after those finish lines, and then crashing uh, a, a few meters later. So when I was thinking about that, I really do. I think the time to slow down a lot is is I mean is, is anywhere, but but I think after you've actually had some success to to, to recalibrate. I think it's a great catch, Bob. I didn't do a lot of athletics at school, but I never <laughs> forgot. You always have to run fast through the finish line. Don't slow down before it stops. Yeah. But when you're a high performer, you don't stop. You keep going. And, and you, you give yourself about 27 seconds to acknowledge the success you've had yeah. before you're on to the next project. Yeah, it's not different than the analogy you shared about the, if you're the car and coming out of one corner, right? It, it, yep. it, it's very similar. Where are we going next, Bob? Uh, I think you're uh, you're you're taking us into the uh, lessons to learn. Okay, I got a problem with my computer here. It's are you touching the the mouse? <laughs> okay, my computer keeps moving around. Okay, well, I, I, I'll yeah. kick us off here. We'll do we're gonna we're gonna kind of move towards towards a recap here. So, um, why, why not start off with Michael? Michael, what's uh what's the hardest lesson for you to learn about success? Yeah, we thought we we would finish this. You know, we you've you've had the three of us do some teaching, you know, different ways, an interview, a teach a kind of workshoppy thing, uh, Rich doing some beautiful coaching. Um, and we thought we'd finish in the last 10 minutes or so by sitting with this question, which is, you know, what's the hardest lesson to learn about success? And so the invitation is there for everybody here to sit with this because remember, this overall is about success on your terms. And what you've heard from me and from Rich and from Bob in our different ways is to provoke you to think about what success is, what definitions of success you've carried, and you need to understand what you are learning about success so that you can embrace the next best version of success. So when I think about what's the hardest lesson of success for me to learn, I'm trying to find words that don't quite repeat what we've already said, because some of the, I mean, I love what we saw with Rich and Navina coaching. Literally last week, <laughs> I went and had an acupuncture session on my, my right forearm, which is giving me a bit of trouble. And the acupuncturist basically hit a nerve or something, and it paralyzed me. I was literally on this bed for 45 minutes, and I couldn't move without my arm being in pain. So I had to literally just stare at a ceiling for 45 minutes. I had some great ideas. I mean, it was fantastic in terms of some deep work moment. That's exactly what Rich was talking about. Um, so I do, I, I think it actually comes back, Bob, to what I was saying for my lesson, which is celebrate the success that you have. Um, you know, um, I check in every morning with three questions in my journal. One is, what do I notice? Uh, the third one is what's the one thing today that I, I want to try and do today was to rock the summit. But the, the second one, and this is such a well-known question, but it, it should be, which is like, what am I grateful for? And that is a moment to stop and celebrate the stuff. And that's what I'm most trying to learn about, not just success, but life, which is, you know, what am I most grateful for? Um, how about, um, uh, Oh, I was going to say, how about I ask you, Rich, what, um, what's what been the hardest lesson for success for you? Um, getting to the level of success I am to date 
meant I had to say yes to almost every opportunity that arose. Mm. Getting to my next level of success is saying no to almost every opportunity that arises. And that's a really hard one to learn. Oh, I totally get that. Thanks for saying yes to this, by the way. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm grateful you did. Um, and Bob? Yeah, What's the yeah I... I, I... It's interesting. I, I didn't have time to send it to you guys before, but it was an article that found me this morning, ironically. But but I think there's this version of the destination versus journey. And I think that a lot of the things that we've looked forward to and the big goals, and we think they're going to make us happy. And sometimes it doesn't. And it feels yeah. really weird because we thought about it for a while. The article was actually about the founder of Bonobos, which sold to Walmart, and he made a ton of money. And you know that was his big successful exit. And everyone's talking to him about it. And he said, you know, I, I actually enjoyed the building more. I realized I missed the building. What I enjoyed was the building and the struggle and the making all the money. Like it just didn't feel good. I know when people hear that they doubt it and people say money won't buy happiness, but I, I just heard these stories enough and I've seen them enough and I've been part of some of them that uh, again, if you think it's going to be an event um, that, that there's a lot of, a lot of disappointment about what, 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 what parts of success make you happy and don't. Yeah. <sighs> Our work here is almost done. We said we'd be done in about 75 minutes and uh, the time is cl closing in and we really want to honor that time. Let me just give you a, everybody who's listening a heads up on what's going to happen. Over the next week or so, you're going to get a, a short series of emails from the three of us combined. Um, it's going to be uh, access to the replay. It's going to be access to the first chapters of books so you can access to kind of see what we're up to. Um, and just a kind of a, a way of ending and finishing and celebrating the fact that you're part of this summit. Yeah. After that, you will be on all three of our people's, our newsletter email lists. So that's part of why we do this, which is we wanted to introduce our audiences to each other. And you'll be signed up to all of us. We, we, I think we were all planned little introductions so you don't suddenly start getting weird emails from people that you weren't expecting. Of course, you have an open invitation to unsubscribe to whatever things that, that don't fit you and fit your inbox. But you will be initially signed up for that, and then you get to choose to do with that what you will. Um, uh, I think that's all I need to tell you other than to um, – I want to just acknowledge and thank all the people who've been behind the scenes around this. Bob and Rick both have their teams. But on, on our end, we've had Justin, our producer, who has been managing the comments, managing the vibe and the thing. He does such a great job for us. So, Justin, thank you for doing that. There he is, rocking it. He's available for, for hire. So if you're ever running an online show, get in touch with the, the MBS.Works team, and I can introduce you to Justin because he is a master at what he does. Um, and on the MBS Works team, uh, Tuba and Sarah in particular did a ton of work. Uh, there's Sarah, uh, who's our director of ops at MS Works, and Tuba is actually based in Turkey. So you can imagine what's been going on in Tuba's life with the earthquakes and all the, the, the horrible stuff that's been happening there. And as she's managed all of that in her country, she's done such a brilliant job at looking after the three of us as the speakers and getting all of this across the line. She's done just been fantastic. So Tuba, thank you so much for that. Um, Bob, I'm going to hand it to you. Yeah. Now ask the group the very final question we might want to ask yeah we just want to blow up the chat what last one last time and you know it's not a competition but but what what was the most helpful thing what was your biggest takeaway today what can you act on we'd love to have you pop that in the in the chat bob let me let me throw it back to you what was most helpful for you in all of this um you know it was sort of a medici effect i think as as i was saying with rich like the combination of ideas and seeing how they interplay uh, with each other. Uh, I, I have some new combination of thoughts that I didn't have before. Yeah, beautiful. Rich, what about for you? Apart from asking you to see your whole family, which is awesome. <laughs> Almost my whole family. Um, hey, what, what struck me the most is what you said about friendship and, and making sure that you have people in your life who are fun and create interesting conversations. And, and that's what we've been doing here. I've been having fun and interesting conversations. And Bob, when you said... Actually, it doesn't have to be constantly. There are some people in my life I just meet up with for two hours for fun, interesting conversations. That really struck me. So it's been a real pleasure to spend time with you guys. Yeah, thank you, Rich. For me, I think uh, I think what I was least comfortable with was watching you hold the silence for Lavina. Oh, that's who I didn't thank. Lavina, 
thank you for coming up and being voluntold to to coach with with Rich. You you were you were perfect. You were wonderful, and we appreciate being vulnerable and open and sharing that conversation. So, Lavina, apologies for missing you earlier on, and thank you for that great contribution. Um, and Rich, I I loved. Here's what I took away, and this is the master, the mastery of your coaching. There's a there's a saying that the medium is the message. You want to design and create the experience that reinforces the point that you're teaching. And as you talk about and you teach and you coach around slowing down and creating space, you're literally slowing down and you're creating space. And I could feel the the I would, I'm going to say the awkwardness of that silence. And I know the power of that <laughs> and just how significant that is as something to bring to any coaching encounter. But I just love watching that subtle mastery of yours around how you created an experience that reflected the words that you were saying. Thanks, Michael. I've got a client who jokes that he's paid me more money to say nothing than anyone he's ever spent money on in his life. <laughs> All right, everybody. I think our work here is done. We're finishing five minutes early, which is a bonus. You get an early mark. Bob, Rich, thank you. Congratulations thank you, on your two books that look amazing. Bob in particular, I hope you have a great rest of the day uh, waiting for the launch of it. And to everybody who's joined us today, thank you so much. Thank you for being so active in the comments. Amazing. Uh, it's such so cool to see the comments blow up. And thanks to everybody behind the scenes. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.